Before we get into the show, got to give a huge shout out to Brianna Joy, who left a nice little comment on the Spotify comment section, I guess. <laughs> Such a fun listen. I absolutely love the narration voices and the obvious care put into making this a great experience for the listeners. Thank you, Brianna, for those kind words. If you want to leave a comment, you can on uh, Spotify. So if you're listening on Spotify, do that. Or if you're more of a YouTube person, you can leave comments there or just shoot me an email, anotherworldaudiobooks at gmail.com. Welcome back to Another World Audiobooks. So happy to have you here. Thank you for tuning in to this show. I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. I would love to hear from you and get in touch with me and let me know what your thoughts are. If you're enjoying this book, I'd love to hear from you. If you have any suggestions for books to do in the future, I'd love to hear from you. I just love hearing from the people that uh, are listening to the podcast. It just makes it feel more like a conversation and less of me just talking to a microphone. So thanks for listening, guys. And uh, let's get into it. Without further ado, I give you the next chapter of Arsene Lupin. Six. The Seven of Hearts I am frequently asked this question. How did you make the acquaintance of Arsène Lupin? My connection with Arsène Lupin was well known. The details that I gather concerning that mysterious man, the irrefutable facts that I present, the new evidence that I produce, the interpretation that I place on certain acts of which the public has seen only the exterior manifestations, without being able to discover all the secret reasons, or the invisible mechanism, all establish, if not an intimacy, at least amicable relations and regular confidences. But how did I make his acquaintance? Why was I selected to be his historiographer? Why I and not someone else? The answer is simple. Chance alone presided over my choice. My merit was not considered. It was chance that put me in his way. It was by chance that I was participant in one of his strangest and most mysterious adventures, and by chance that I was an actor in a drama of which he was the marvellous stage director, an obscure and intricate drama, bristling with such thrilling events that I feel a certain embarrassment in undertaking to describe it. The first act takes place during that memorable night of the 22nd of June, of which so much has already been said. And for my part, I attribute the anomalous conduct of which I was guilty on that occasion to the unusual frame of mind in which I found myself on my return home. I had dined with some friends at the Cascade Restaurant, and the entire evening, whilst we smoked and the orchestra played melancholy waltzes, we talked only of crimes and thefts and dark and frightful intrigues. That is always a poor overture to a night's sleep. The Saint Martins went away in an automobile. Jean d'Esprit, that delightful, heedless d'Esprit, who, six months later, was killed in such a tragic manner on the frontier of Morocco. Jean d'Esprit and I returned on foot through the dark, warm night. When we arrived in front of the little house in which I had lived for a year at Neuilly, on the boulevard Maillot, he said to me, "'Are you afraid? What an idea!' But this house is so isolated. No neighbors, vacant lots. Really, I am not a coward, and yet... Well, you are very cheering, I must say. Oh, I say that as I would say anything else. The San Martins have impressed me with their stories of brigands and thieves. We shook hands and said good night. I took out my key and opened the door. Well, that is good, I murmured. Antoine has forgotten to light a candle. Then I recalled the fact that Antoine was away. I had given him a short leave of absence. Forthwith, I was disagreeably oppressed by the darkness and silence of the night. I ascended the stairs on tiptoe, and reached my room as quickly as possible. Then, contrary to my usual habit, I turned the key and pushed the bolt. The light of my candle restored my courage, yet I was careful to take my revolver from its case, a large, powerful weapon, and place it beside my bed. That precaution completed my reassurance. I laid down and, as usual, took a book from my night table to read myself to sleep. Then I received a great surprise. Instead of the paper knife with which I had marked my place on the proceeding, I found an envelope, closed with five seals of red wax. I seized it eagerly. It was addressed to me and marked, Urgent. A letter? A letter addressed to me? Who could have put it in that place? Nervously, I tore open the envelope and read, From the moment you open this letter, whatever happens, whatever you may hear, do not move, do not utter one cry, otherwise you are doomed. I am not a coward, and quite as well as another I can face real danger, or smile at the visionary perils of imagination. But let me repeat, 
I was in an anomalous condition of mind, with my nerves set on edge by the events of the evening. Besides, was there not in my present situation something startling and mysterious, calculated to disturb the most courageous spirit? My feverish fingers clutched the sheet of paper, and I read and reread those threatening words. Do not move. Do not utter one cry. Otherwise, you are doomed. Nonsense, I thought. It is a joke, the work of some cheerful idiot. I was about to laugh, a good, loud laugh. Who prevented me? What haunting fear compressed my throat? At least I would blow out the candle. No, I could not do it. Do not move, or you are doomed, were the words he had written. These auto-suggestions are frequently more imperious than the most positive realities. But why should I struggle against them? I had simply to close my eyes. I did so. At that moment I heard a slight noise, followed by crackling sounds, proceeding from a large room used by me as a library. A small room or antechamber was situated between the library and my bedchamber. The approach of an actual danger greatly excited me, and I felt a desire to get up, seize my revolver, and rush into the library. I did not rise. I saw one of the curtains of the left window move. There was no doubt about it. The curtain had moved. It was still moving, and I saw, oh, I saw quite distinctly, in the narrow space between the curtains and the window, a human form, a bulky mass that prevented the curtains from hanging straight. And it is equally certain that the man saw me through the large meshes of the curtain. Then I understood the situation. His mission was to guard me while the others carried away their booty. Should I rise and seize my revolver? Impossible. He was there. At the least movement, at the least cry, I was doomed. There came a terrific noise that shook the house. This was followed by lighter sounds, two or three together, like those of a hammer that rebounded. At least that was the impression formed in my confused brain. These were mingled with other sounds, thus creating a veritable uproar which proved that the intruders were not only bold, but felt themselves secure from interruption. They were right. I did not move. Was it cowardice? No, rather weakness, a total inability to move any portion of my body, combined with discretion. For why should I struggle? Behind that man, there were ten others who had come to his assistance. Should I risk my life to save a few tapestries in Bibilo? Throughout the night, my torture endured. Insufferable torture, terrible anguish. The noises had stopped, but I was in constant fear of their renewal. And the man, the man who was guarding me, weapon in hand... My fearful eyes remained cast in his direction, and my heart beat, and a profuse perspiration oozed from every pore of my body. Suddenly, I experienced an immense relief. A milk wagon, whose sound was familiar to me, passed along the boulevard, and at the same time, I had an impression that the light of a new day was trying to steal through the closed window blinds. At last, daylight penetrated the room. Other vehicles passed along the boulevard, and all the phantoms of the night vanished. Then I put one arm out of the bed, slowly and cautiously. My eyes were fixed upon the curtain, locating the exact spot at which I must fire. I made an exact calculation of the movements I must make. Then, quickly, I seized my revolver and fired. I leaped from my bed with a cry of deliverance and rushed to the window. The bullet had passed through the curtain and the window glass, but it had not touched the man, for the very good reason that there was none there. Nobody... Thus, during the entire night I had been hypnotized by a fold of the curtain, and during that time the male factors, furiously, with an enthusiasm that nothing could have stopped, I turned the key, opened the door, crossed the antechamber, opened another door, and rushed into the library. But amazement stopped me on the threshold, panting, astounded, more astonished than I had been by the absence of the man. All the things that I supposed had been stolen, furniture, books, pictures, old tapestries, everything was in its proper place. It was incredible. I could not believe my eyes. Notwithstanding that uproar, those noises of removal, I made a tour, I inspected the walls, I made a mental inventory of all the familiar objects. Nothing was missing. And what was more disconcerting, there was no clue to the intruders, not a sign, not a chair disturbed, not the trace of a footstep. Well, well, I said to myself, pressing my hands on my bewildered head. Surely I am not crazy. I heard something. 
Inch by inch, I made a careful examination of the room. It was in vain. Unless I consider this a discovery. Under a small Persian rug, I found a card. An ordinary playing card. It was the Seven of Hearts. It was like any other Seven of Hearts in French playing cards, with this slight but curious exception. The extreme point of each of the seven red spots or hearts was pierced by a hole, round and regular, as if made with the point of an awl. Nothing more. A card and a letter found in a book. But was that not sufficient to affirm that I had not been the plaything of a dream? Throughout the day, I continued my searches in the library. It was a large room, much too large for the requirements of such a house, and the decoration of which attested the bizarre taste of its founder. The floor was a mosaic of multicolored stones, formed into a large symmetrical design. The walls were covered with a similar mosaic, arranged in panels. Pompeian allegories, Byzantine compositions, frescoes of the Middle Ages. A Bacchus bestriding a cask, an emperor wearing a gold crown, a flowing beard, and holding a sword in his right hand. Quite high, after the style of an artist's studio, there was a large window, the only one in the room. That window being always open at night, it was probable that the men had entered through it by the aid of a ladder, but again there was no evidence. The bottom of the ladder would have left some marks in the soft earth beneath the window, but there was none. Nor were there any traces of footsteps in any part of the yard. I had no idea of informing the police, because the facts I had before me were so absurd and inconsistent. They would laugh at me. However, as I was then a reporter on the staff of the Gilles Blas, I wrote a lengthy account of my adventure, and it was published in the paper on the second day thereafter. The article attracted some attention, but no one took it seriously. They regarded it as a work of fiction rather than a story of real life. The saint Martins rallied me, but D'Aspry, who took an interest in such matters, came to see me, made a study of the affair, but reached no conclusion. A few mornings later, the doorbell rang, and Antoine came to inform me that a gentleman desired to see me. He would not give his name. I directed Antoine to show him up. He was a man of about forty years of age, with a very dark complexion, lively features, and whose correct dress, slightly frayed, proclaimed a taste that contrasted strangely with his rather vulgar manners. Without any preamble, he said to me, in a rough voice that confirmed my suspicion as to his social position, Monsieur, whilst in a cafe, I picked up a copy of the Gilles Blas and read your article. It interested me very much. Thank you. And here I am. Ah? Uh, yes, to talk to you. Are all the facts related by you quite correct? Absolutely so. Well... In that case, I can, perhaps, give you some information. Very well. Proceed. No, not yet. First, I must make sure that the facts are exactly as you have related them. I have given you my word. What further proof do you want? I must remain alone in this room. I do not understand, I said with surprise. It's an idea that occurred to me when reading your article... Certain details established an extraordinary coincidence with another case that came under my notice. If I am mistaken, I shall say nothing more, and the only means of ascertaining the truth is by my remaining in the room alone. What was at the bottom of this proposition? Later, I recalled that the man was exceedingly nervous, but at the same time, although somewhat astonished, I found nothing particularly abnormal about the man or the request he had made. Moreover, my curiosity was aroused, so I replied, Very well. How much time do you require? Ah, uh, three minutes. No longer. Three minutes from now, I will rejoin you. I left the room and went downstairs. I took out my watch. One minute passed. Two minutes. Why did I feel so depressed? Why did those moments seem so solemn and weird? Two minutes and a half. Two minutes and three quarters. Then... I heard a pistol shot. I bounded up the stairs and entered the room. A cry of horror escaped me. In the middle of the room, the man was lying on his left side, motionless. Blood was flowing from a wound in his forehead. Near his hand was a revolver, still smoking. But in addition to this frightful spectacle, my attention was attracted by another object. 
At two feet from the body, upon the floor, I saw a playing card. It was the Seven of Hearts. I picked it up. The lower extremity of each of the seven spots was pierced with a small round hole. A half hour later, the commissary of police arrived, then the coroner and the chief of the surety, Monsieur Dudouis. I had been careful not to touch the corpse. The preliminary inquiry was very brief and disclosed nothing. There was no papers in the pockets of the deceased, no name upon his clothes, no initial upon his linen, nothing to give any clue to his identity. The room was in the same perfect order as before. The furniture had not been disturbed. Yet this man had not come to my house solely for the purpose of killing himself, or because he considered my place the most convenient one for his suicide. There must have been a motive for his act of despair, and that motive was, no doubt, the result of some new fact ascertained by him during the three minutes he was alone. What was that fact? What had he seen? What frightful secret had been revealed to him? There was no answer to these questions. But at the last moment, an incident occurred that appeared to us of considerable importance. As two policemen were raising the body to place it on a stretcher, the left hand thus being disturbed, a crumpled card fell from it. The card bore these words. Georges Andermont, 37 Rue de Berry. What did that mean? Georges Andermatt was a rich banker in Paris, the founder and president of the metal exchange which had given such an impulse to the metallic industries in France. He lived in a princely style, was the possessor of numerous automobiles, coaches, and an expensive racing stable. His social affairs were very select, and Madame Andermatt was noted for her grace and beauty. Can that be the man's name? I asked. The chief of the surety leaned over him. It is not he. Monsieur Andermatt is a thin man, and slightly grey. But why this card? Have you a telephone, monsieur? Yes, in the vestibule. Come with me. He looked in the directory, and then asked for the number 41521. Is Monsieur Andermatt at home? Please tell him that Monsieur Dudouis wished him to come at once to 102 Boulevard Meillot. Very important. Twenty minutes later, Monsieur Andermatt arrived in his automobile. After the circumstances had been explained to him, he was taken in to see the corpse. He displayed considerable emotion, and spoke in a low voice and apparently unwillingly. Etienne Veron, he said. You know him? No, or at least yes, but slightly only. His brother? Ah, he has a brother. Yes. Alfred Varin. He came to me once on some matter of business. I forget what it was. Where does he live? The two brothers live together. Rue de Provence, I think. Do you know any reason why he should commit suicide? None. He held a card in his hand. It was your card with your address. I do not understand that. It must have been there by some chance that will be disclosed by the investigation. A very strange chance, I thought, and I felt that others entertained the same impression. I discovered the same impression in the papers next day, and amongst all my friends with whom I discussed the affair. Amid the mysteries that enveloped it, after the double discovery of the Seven of Hearts pierced with seven holes, after the two inscrutable events that had happened in my house, that visiting card promised to throw some light on the affair. Through it, the truth may be revealed, but... Contrary to our expectations, Monsieur Andermont finished with no explanation. He said, I have told you all I know. What more can I do? I am greatly surprised that my card should be found in such a place, and I sincerely hope the point will be cleared up. It was not. The official investigation established that the Valin brothers were of Swiss origin, had led a shifting life under various names, frequenting gambling resorts, associating with a band of foreigners who had been dispersed by the police after a series of robberies in which their participation was established only by their flight. At number 24 Rue de Provence, where the Varin brothers had lived six years before, no one knew what had become of them. I confess that, for my part, the case seemed to me so complicated and so mysterious that I did not think the problem would ever be solved, so I concluded to waste no more time upon it, 
But Jean d'Esprit, whom I frequently met at that period, became more and more interested in it each day. It was he who pointed out to me that item from a foreign newspaper which was reproduced and commented upon by the entire press. It was as follows. The first trial of a new model of submarine boat, which is expected to revolutionize naval warfare, will be given in presence of the former emperor at a place that will be kept secret until the last minute. An indiscretion has revealed its name. It is called the Seven of Hearts. The Seven of Hearts? That presented a new problem. Could a connection be established between the name of the submarine and the incidents which we have related? But a connection of what nature? What had happened here could have no possible relation with the submarine. What do you know about it? said Daspri to me. The most diverse effects often proceed from the same cause. Two days later, the following foreign news item was received and published. It is said that the plans of the new submarine Seven of Hearts were prepared by French engineers, who, having sought in vain the support of their compatriots, subsequently entered into negotiations with the British Admiralty without success. I do not wish to give undue publicity to certain delicate matters which once provoked considerable excitement, yet since all danger of injury therefrom has now come to an end, I must speak of the article that appeared in the Echo de France, which aroused so much comment at that time, and which threw considerable light upon the mystery of the Seven of Hearts. This is the article as it was published over the signature of Salvatore. The Affair of the Seven of Hearts, a corner of the veil raised. We will be brief. Ten years ago, a young mining engineer, Louis Lacombe, wishing to devote his time and fortune to certain studies, resigned his position he then held, and rented number 102 Boulevard Maillot, a small house that had been recently built and decorated for an Italian count. Through the agency of the Valin brothers of Lausanne, one of whom assisted in the preliminary experiments, and the other acted as financial agent, the young engineer was introduced to Georges Andermont, the founder of the Metal Exchange. After several interviews, he succeeded in interesting the banker in a submarine boat on which he was working, and it was agreed that as soon as the invention was perfected, Monsieur Andermont would use his influence with the Minister of Marine to obtain a series of trials under the direction of the government. For two years, Louis Lacombe was a frequent visitor at Andermont's house, and he submitted to the banker the various improvements he made upon his original plans, until one day, being satisfied with the perfection of his work, he asked Monsieur Andermont to communicate with the Minister of Marine. That day, Louis Lecombe dined at Monsieur Andermatt's house. He left there about half-past eleven at night. He has not been seen since. A perusal of the newspapers of that date will show that the young man's family caused every possible inquiry to be made, but without success, and it was the general opinion that Louis Lecombe, who was known as an original and visionary youth, had quietly left for parts unknown. Let us accept that theory, improbable though it be, and let us consider another question, which is a most important one for our country. What has become of the plans of the submarine? Did Louis Lecombe carry them away? Are they destroyed? After making a thorough investigation, we are able to assert positively that the plans are in existence and are now in the possession of the two brothers Verlin. How did they acquire such a possession? That is a question not yet determined nor do we know why they had not tried to sell them at an earlier date. Did they fear that their title to them would be called in question? If so, they have lost that fear, and we can announce definitely that the plans of Louis Lecombe are now the property of foreign power, and we are in a position to publish the correspondence that passed between the Verlin brothers and the representative of that power. The Seven of Hearts, invented by Louis Lecombe, has been actually constructed by our neighbour. Will the invention fulfill the optimistic expectations of those who were concerned in that treacherous act? And the postscript adds, Later, our special correspondent informs us that the preliminary trial of the Seven of Hearts has not been satisfactory. It is quite likely that the plans sold and delivered by the Valin brothers did not include the final document carried by Louis Lecombe to Monsieur Andermatt on the day of his disappearance a document that was indispensable to a thorough understanding of the invention. It contained a summary of the final conclusions of the inventor, and estimates and figures not contained in the other papers. 
Without this document, the plans are incomplete. On the other hand, without the plans, the document is worthless. Now is the time to act and recover what belongs to us. It may be a difficult matter, but we rely upon the assistance of Monsieur Andemat. It will be to his interest to explain his conduct which has hitherto been so strange and inscrutable. He will explain not only why he concealed these facts at the time of the suicide of Etienne Verlaine, but also why he has never revealed the disappearance of the paper, a fact well known to him. He will tell why, during the last six years, he paid spies to watch the movements of the Verlaine brothers. We expect from him not only words, but acts, and at once. Otherwise. The threat was plainly expressed, but of what did it consist? What whip was Salvatore? the anonymous writer of the article holding over the head of Monsieur Ardemont. An army of reporters attacked the banker, and ten interviewers announced the scornful manner in which they were treated. Thereupon, the Echo de France announced its position in these words. Whether Monsieur Ardemont is willing or not, he will be henceforth our collaborator in the work we have undertaken. Despri and I were dining together on the day on which the announcement appeared, that evening, with the newspapers spread over my table, we discussed the affair and examined it from every point of view with that exasperation that a person feels when walking in the dark and finding himself constantly falling over the same obstacles. Suddenly, without any warning whatsoever, the door opened and a lady entered. Her face was hidden behind a thick veil. I rose at once and approached her. "'Is it you, monsieur, who lives here?' she asked. "'Yes, madame, but I do not understand.' "'The gate was not locked,' she explained. "'But the vestibule door?' She did not reply, and it occurred to me that she had used the servant's entrance. How did she know the way? Then there was a silence that was quite embarrassing. She looked at Despre, and I was obliged to introduce him. I asked her to be seated and explain the object of her visit. She raised her veil, and I saw that she was a brunette, with regular features, and, though not handsome, she was attractive, principally on account of her sad, dark eyes. "'I am Madame Andermatt, she said. "'Madame Andermatt, I repeated with astonishment. After a brief pause, she continued with a voice and manner that were quite easy and natural. "'I have come to see you about that affair. You know, I thought I might be able to obtain some information.' Mon Dieu, madame, I know nothing but what has already appeared in the papers. But if you will point out in what way I can help you... I do not know. I do not know. Not until then did I suspect that her calm demeanour was assumed, and that some poignant grief was concealed beneath that air of tranquillity. For a moment we were silent and embarrassed. Then Despree stepped forward and said, Will you permit me to ask you a few questions? Yes, yes she cried. I will answer. You will answer, whatever those questions may be. Yes. Did you know Louis Lecombe? he asked. Yes, through my husband. When did you see him for the last time? The evening he dined with us. At that time, was there anything to lead you to believe that you would never see him again? No, but he had spoken of a trip to Russia in a vague way. Then you expected to see him again? Yes, he was to dine with us two days later. How do you explain his disappearance? I cannot explain it. And Monsieur Andermatt? I do not know. Yet the article published in the Echo de France indicates, yes, that the Verlin brothers had something to do with his disappearance. Is that your opinion? Yes. On what do you base your opinion? When he left our house... Louis de Combe carried a satchel containing all the papers relating to his invention. Two days later, my husband, in a conversation with one of the Verlin brothers, learned that the papers were in their possession. And he did not denounce them? No. Why not? Because there was something else in the satchel, something besides the papers of Louis de Combe. What was it? She hesitated, was on the point of speaking, but finally remained silent. Dospery continued. I presume that is why your husband has kept a close watch over their movements instead of informing the police. He hoped to recover the papers and, at the same time, that compromising article which has enabled the two brothers to hold over him threats of exposure and blackmail. Over him and over me. Ah, over you also. 
over me in particular. She uttered the last words in a hollow voice. Despree observed it. He paced to and fro for a moment, then, turning to her, asked, Had you written to Louis Le Combe? Of course. My husband had business with him. Apart from those business letters, had you written to Louis Le Combe? Other letters? Excuse my insistence, but it is absolutely necessary that I should know the truth. Did you write other letters? Yes, she replied, blushing. And those letters came into the possession of the Valin brothers? Yes. Does Monsieur Andemont know it? He has not seen them, but Alfred Valin has told him of their existence, and threatened to publish them if my husband should take any steps against him. My husband was afraid of a scandal. But he has tried to recover the letters. I think so, but I do not know. You see, after that last interview with Alfred Valin, and after some harsh words between me and my husband in which he called me to account, we live as strangers. In that case, as you have nothing to lose, what do you fear? It may be indifferent to him now, but I am the woman that he has loved, the one he would still love. <laughs> I am quite sure of that, she murmured in a fervent voice. He would still love me if he had not got hold of those cursed letters. What? Did he succeed? But the two brothers still defied him. Yes, and they boasted of having a secure hiding place. Well? I believe my husband discovered that hiding place. Ah, where was it? Here. Here? I cried in alarm. Yes, I always had that suspicion. Louis de Combe was very ingenious and amused himself in his leisure hours by making safes and locks. No doubt the Verlin brothers were aware of that fact, and utilized one of Lecombe's safes in which to conceal the letters, and other things, perhaps. But they did not live here, I said. Before you came, four months ago, the house had been vacant for some time, and they may have thought that your presence here would not interfere with them when they wanted to get the papers. But they did not count on my husband, who came here on the night of the 22nd of June, forced the safe, took what he was seeking, and left his card to inform the two brothers that he feared them no more, and that their positions were now reversed. Two days later, after reading the article in the Gilles Bas, Etienne Varin came here, remained alone in this room, found the safe empty, and killed himself. After a moment, Despree said, A very simple theory. Has Monsieur Ardemont spoken to you since then? No. Has his attitude toward you changed in any way? Does he appear more gloomy, more anxious? No, I haven't noticed any change. And yet you think he has secured the letters? Now, in my opinion, he has not got those letters, and it was not he who came here on the night of the 22nd of June. Who was it, then? The mysterious individual who is managing this affair who holds all the threads in his hands, and whose invisible but far-reaching power we have felt from the beginning. It was he and his friends who entered this house on the 22nd of June. It was he who discovered the hiding place of the papers. It was he who left Monsieur Audemont's card. It is he who now holds the correspondence and the evidence of the treachery of the Valin brothers. Who is he? I asked impatiently. The man who writes letters to the Echo de France. Salvatore! Have we not convincing evidence of that fact? Does he not mention in his letters certain details that no one could know, except the man who had thus discovered the secrets of the two brothers? Well then, stammered Madame Almart, in great alarm, he has my letters also, and it is he who now threatens my husband. Mon Dieu, what am I to do? Write to him, declared Despree. Confide in him without reserve. Tell him all you know, and all you may hereafter learn. Your interest and his interest are the same. He is not working against Monsieur Andemart, but against Alfred Varin. Help him. How? Has your husband the document that completes the plans of Louis Lecombe? Yes. Tell that to Salvatore, and, if possible, procure the document for him. Write to him at once. You risk nothing. The advice was bold, dangerous even at first sight, but Madame Andemart had no choice. Besides, as Despree had said, she ran no risk. If the unknown writer were an enemy, that step would not aggravate the situation. If he were a stranger seeking to accomplish a particular purpose, he would attach to those letters only a secondary importance. Whatever might happen, it was the only solution offered to her, and she, in her anxiety, was only too glad to act on it. 
She thanked us effusively and promised to keep us informed. In fact, two days later, she sent us the following letter that she had received from Salvatore. Have not found the letters, but I will get them. Rest easy, I am watching everything. S. I looked at the letter. It was in the same handwriting as the note I found in my book on the night of the 22nd of June. Daspri was right. Salvatore was indeed the originator of that affair. We were beginning to see a little light coming out of the darkness that surrounded us, and an unexpected light was thrown on certain points, but other points yet remained obscure. For instance, the finding of the two seven of hearts. Perhaps I was unnecessarily concerned about those two cards whose seven punctured spots had appeared to me under such startling circumstances. Yet I could not refrain from asking myself, what role will they play in the drama? What importance do they bear? What conclusion must be drawn from the fact that the submarine constructed from the plans of Louis Lecombe bore the name of Seven of Hearts? D'Esprit gave little thought to the other two cards. He devoted all his attention to another problem which he considered more urgent. He was seeking the famous hiding place. And who knows? said he. I may find the letters that Salvatore did not find. By inadvertence, perhaps. It is improbable that the Valian brothers would have removed from a spot which they deemed inaccessible the weapon which was so valuable to them. And he continued to search. In a short time, the large room held no more secrets for him, so he extended his investigations to the other rooms. He examined the interior and exterior, the stones of the foundation, the bricks in the walls. He raised the slates of the roof. One day he came with a pickaxe and a spade, gave me the spade, kept the pickaxe, pointed to the adjacent vacant lots, and said, Come. I followed him, but I lacked his enthusiasm. He divided the vacant lot into several sections which he examined in turn. At last, in a corner, at the angle formed by the walls of two neighbouring proprietors, a small pile of earth and gravel, covered with briars and grass, attracted his attention. He attacked it. I was obliged to help him. For an hour, under a hot sun, we laboured without success. I was discouraged, but D'Esprit urged me on. His ardour was as strong as ever. At last, D'Esprit's pickaxe unearthed some bones the remains of a skeleton to which some scraps of clothing still hung. Suddenly, I turned pale. I had discovered, sticking in the earth, a small piece of iron cut in the form of a rectangle, on which I thought I could see red spots. I stooped and picked it up. That little iron plate was the exact size of a playing card, and the red spots made with red lead were arranged upon it in a manner similar to the Seven of Hearts, and each spot was pierced with a round hole similar to the perforations in the two playing cards. Listen, D'Esprit, I have had enough of this. You can stay if it interests you, but I'm going. Was that simply the expression of my excited nerves, or was it the result of a laborious task executed under a burning sun? I know that I trembled as I walked away, and that I went to bed, where I remained forty-eight hours, restless and feverish, haunted by skeletons that danced around me and threw their bleeding hearts at my head. D'Esprit was faithful to me. He came to my house every day and remained three or four hours which he spent in the large room, ferreting, thumping, tapping. "'The letters are here in this room,' he said from time to time. "'They are here. I will stake my life on it.' On the morning of the third day I arose, feeble yet but cured. A substantial breakfast cheered me up. But a letter that I received that afternoon contributed, more than anything else, to my complete recovery, and aroused me in a lively curiosity. This was the letter. Monsieur, the drama, the first act of which transpired on the night of the 22nd of June, is now drawing to a close. Force of circumstances compel me to bring the two principal actors in that drama face to face, and I wish that meeting to take place in your house— if you will be so kind as to give me the use of it for this evening from nine o'clock to eleven. It will be advisable to give your servant leave of absence for the evening, and perhaps you will be so kind as to leave the field open to the two adversaries. You will remember that when I visited your house on the night of the 22nd of June, I took excellent care of your property. I feel that I would do you an injustice if I should doubt, for one moment, your absolute discretion in this affair. Your devoted Salvatore.
I was amused at the facetious tone of his letter, and also at the whimsical nature of his request. There was a charming display of confidence and candor in his language, and nothing in the world could have induced me to deceive him or repay his confidence with ingratitude. I gave my servant a theatre ticket, and he left the house at eight o'clock. A few minutes later, Daspri arrived. I showed him the letter. Well, said he, well, I have left the garden gate unlocked, so anyone can enter. And you, are you going away? Not at all. I intend to stay right here. But he asks you to go. But I am not going. I will be discreet, but I am resolved to see what takes place. Ma foi! exclaimed Esprit, laughing. You are right, and I shall stay with you. I shouldn't like to miss it. We were interrupted by the sound of the doorbell. Here already, said Desprey. Twenty minutes ahead of time. Incredible. I went to the door and ushered in the visitor. It was Madame Andermatt. She was faint and nervous, and in a stammering voice she ejaculated, My husband is coming. He has an appointment. They intend to give him the letters. How do you know? I asked. By chance. A message came for my husband while we were at dinner. The servant gave it to me by mistake. My husband grabbed it quickly, but he was too late. I had read it. You read it? Yes, it was something like this. At nine o'clock this evening, be at Boulevard Maillot with the papers connected with the affair. In exchange, the letters. So, after dinner, I hastened here. Unknown to your husband? Yes. What do you think to do about it? asked Esprit, turning to me. I think as you do, that Monsieur Andermatt is one of the invited guests. Yes, but for what purpose? That is what we are going to find out. I led them to a large room. The three of us could hide comfortably behind the velvet chimney mantel, and observe all that should happen in the room. We seated ourselves there, with Madame Andermatt in the center. The clock struck nine. A few minutes later, the garden gate creaked upon its hinges. I confess that I was greatly agitated. I was about to learn the key to the mystery. The startling events of the last few weeks were about to be explained, and, under my eyes, the last battle was going to be fought. Desprez seized the hand of Madame Andermatt and said to her, Not a word, not a movement. Whatever you may see or hear, keep quiet. Someone entered. It was Alfred Valin. I recognized him at once, owing to the close resemblance he bore to his brother Etienne. There was the same slouching gait, the same cadaverous face, covered with a black beard. He entered with the nervous air of a man who was accustomed to fear the presence of traps and ambushes, who scents and avoids them. He glanced about the room, and I had the impression that the chimney, masked with a velvet portiere, did not please him. He took three steps in our direction, when something caused him to turn and walk toward the old mosaic king, with the flowing beard and flamboyant sword, which he examined minutely, mounting a chair and following with his fingers the outlines of the shoulders and head, and feeling certain parts of the face. Suddenly he leaped from the chair and walked away from it. He had heard the sound of approaching footsteps. Monsieur Ardermont appeared at the door. "'You! You!' exclaimed the banker. Was it you who brought me here? I? By no means, protested Valin in a rough, jerky voice that reminded me of his brother. On the contrary, it was your letter that brought me here. My letter? A letter signed by you, in which you offered... I never wrote to you, declared Monsieur Aldermont. You did not write to me? Instinctively, Valin was put on his guard, not against the banker, but against the unknown enemy who had drawn him into this trap. A second time he looked in our direction, then walked toward the door, but Monsieur Ardermont barred his passage. Where are you going, Valin? There's something about this affair I don't like. I'm going home. Good evening. One moment. No need of that, Monsieur Ardermont. I have nothing to say to you. But I have something to say to you, and this is a good time to say it. Let me pass. No, you will not pass. Valin recoiled before the resolute attitude of the banker as he muttered, Well then, be quick about it. One thing astonished me, and I have no doubt my two companions experienced a similar feeling. 
Why was Salvator not there? Was he not a necessary part at this conference? Or was he satisfied to let these two adversaries fight it out between themselves? At all events, his absence was a great disappointment, although it did not detract from the dramatic strength of the situation. After a moment, Monsieur Ardermont approached Valin, and face to face, eye to eye, said, Now, after all these years, and when you have nothing more to fear, you can answer me candidly. What have you done with Louis Lecombe? What a question, as if I knew anything about him. You do know. You and your brother were his constant companions, almost lived with him in this very house. You knew all about his plans and his work, and the last night I ever saw Louis Le Combe, when I parted with him at my door, I saw two men slinking away in the shadows of the trees. That I am ready to swear to. Well, what has that to do with me? The two men were you and your brother. Prove it. The best proof is that two days later, you yourself showed me the papers and the plans that belonged to Lacombe, and offered to sell them. How did these papers come into your possession? I've already told you, Monsieur Audemont, that we found them on Louis Lacombe's table the morning after his disappearance. That is a lie. Prove it. The law will prove it. Why did you not appeal to the law? Why? Uh, why? stammered the banker, with a slight display of emotion. You know very well, Monsieur Ardermont, if you had the least certainty of your guilt, our little threat would not have stopped you. What threat? Those letters? Do you suppose I ever gave those letters a moment's thought? If you did not care for the letters, why did you offer me thousands of francs for their return? And why did you have my brother and me tracked like wild beasts? To recover the plans. Nonsense. You wanted the letters. You knew that as soon as you had the letters in your possession, you could denounce us. Oh no, I couldn't part with them. He laughed heartily, but stopped suddenly and said, But enough of this. We are merely going over all ground. We make no headway. We had better let things stand as they are. We will not let them stand as they are, said the banker. And since you have referred to the letters, let me tell you that you will not leave this house until you deliver up those letters. I shall go when I please. You will not. Be careful, Monsieur Aldermont. I'll warn you. I say you shall not go. We will see about that, cried Varin, in such a rage that Madame Aldermont could not suppress a cry of fear. Varim must have heard it, for he now tried to force his way out. Monsieur Andermont pushed him back. Then I saw him put his hand into his coat pocket. For the last time, let me pass, he cried. The letters first. Varin drew a revolver, and pointing at Monsieur Andermont said, Yes or no. The banker stooped quickly. There was the sound of a pistol shot. The weapon fell from Varin's hand. I was amazed. The shot was fired close to me. It was Desprez who had fired it at Varin, causing him to drop the revolver. In a moment, Desprez was standing between the two men, facing Varin. He said to him with a sneer, You were lucky, my friend, very lucky. I fired at your hand and struck only the revolver. Both of them looked at him surprised. Then he turned to the banker and said, I beg your pardon, monsieur, for meddling in your business, but really, you play a very poor game. Let me hold the cards. Turning again to Valin, Desprez said, It's between us two, comrade, and play fair, if you please. Hearts are trumps, and I play the seven. Then Desprez held up, before Valin's bewildered eyes, the little iron plate, marked with the seven red spots. It was a terrible shock to Valin. With livid features, staring eyes, and an air of intense agony, the man seemed to be hypnotized at the sight of it. "'Who are you?' he gasped. "'One who meddles in other people's business, down to the very bottom. "'What do you want?' "'What you brought here tonight.' "'I brought nothing.' "'Yes, you did, or you wouldn't have come. "'This morning you received an invitation to come here at nine o'clock.' and bring with you all the papers held by you. You are here, 
Where are the papers? There was in Despree's voice and manner a tone of authority that I did not understand. His manner was usually quite mild and conciliatory. Absolutely conquered, Valin placed his hand on one of his pockets and said, The papers are here. All of them? Yes. All that you took from Louis Lecombe and afterwards sold to Major von Lieben? Yes. Are these the copies or the originals? I have the originals. How much do you want for them? One hundred thousand francs. <laughs> you are crazy, said Despree. Why, the Major gave you only twenty thousand, and that was like money thrown into the sea, as the boat was a failure at the preliminary trials. They didn't understand the plans. The plans are not complete. Then why do you ask me for them? Because I want them. I offer you five thousand francs, not a sou more. Ten thousand, not a sou less. Agreed, said Despree, who now turned to Monsieur Ardermart and said, Monsieur will kindly sign a cheque for the amount. But I haven't got... Your chequebook? Here it is. Astounded, Monsieur Ardermont examined the chequebook that Despree handed to him. It is mine, he gasped. How does that happen? No idle words, monsieur, if you please. You have merely to sign. The banker took out his fountain pen, filled out the cheque, and signed it. Valin held out his hand for it. Put down your hand, said Despree. There is something more. Then to the banker, he said, You asked for some letters, did you not? Yes, a package of letters. Where are they, Valin? Oh, I haven't got them. Where are they, Valin? I don't know. My brother had charge of them. They are hidden in this room. In that case, you know where they are. How should I know? Was it not you who found the hiding place? You appear to be as well informed as Salvatore. The letters are not in the hiding place. They are. Open it. Valin looked at him defiantly. Were not Despree and Salvatore the same person? Everything pointed to that conclusion. If so, Valin risked nothing in disclosing a hiding place already known. Open it, repeated Despree. I've not got the Seven of Arts. Yes, here it is, said Despree, handing him the iron plate. Valin recoiled in terror and cried, No, no, I will not. Never mind, replied Despree, as he walked toward the bearded king climbed on a chair, and applied the seven of hearts to the lower part of the sword in such a manner that the edge of the iron plate coincided exactly with the two edges of the sword. Then, with the assistance of an awl which he introduced alternately into each of the seven holes, he pressed upon seven of the little mosaic stones. As he pressed upon the seventh one, a clicking sound was heard, and the entire bust of the king turned upon a pivot, disclosing a large opening lined with steel. It was really a fireproof safe. You can see, Valin, the safe is empty. So I see. Then my brother has taken out the letters. Despree stepped down from the chair, approached Valin, and said, Now, no more nonsense with me. There is another hiding place. Where is it? There is none. Is it money you want? How much? Ten thousand. Monsieur Ardiamont, are those letters worth ten thousand francs to you? Yes, said the banker firmly. Valin closed the safe, took the seven of hearts, and placed it again on the sword in the same spot. He thrust the awl into each of the seven holes. There was the same clicking sound, but this time, strange to relate, it was only a portion of the safe that revolved on the pivot, disclosing quite a small safe that was built within the door of the larger one. The packet of letters was here, tied with a tape and sealed. Valin handed the packet to Despree. The latter turned to the banker and asked, Is the cheque ready, Monsieur Andermont? Yes. And you have also the last document that you received from Louis Lecombe, the one that completes the plans for the submarine? Yes. The exchange was made. Despree pocketed the document and the cheques, and offered the packet of letters to Monsieur Andermont. This is what you wanted, monsieur. The banker hesitated a moment, as if he were afraid to touch those cursed letters that he had sought so eagerly. Then, with a nervous movement, he took them. Close to me, I heard a moan. I grasped Madame Andermont's hand. It was cold. 
I believe, monsieur, said Desprit to the banker, that our business is ended. Oh, no thanks. It was only by a mere chance that I had been able to do you a good turn. Good night. Monsieur Ardermont retired. He carried with him the letters, written by his wife, to Louis de Combe. Marvellous! exclaimed Desprit, delighted. Everything is coming our way. Now we have only to close our little affair, comrade. You have the papers? Here they are, all of them. Desprit examined them carefully, and then placed them in his pocket. Quite right, you have kept your word, he said. But... But what? The two checks, the money, said Valin eagerly. Well, you have a great deal of assurance, my man. How dare you ask such a thing? Why well, ask only what is due to me? Can you ask pay for returning papers that you stole? <laughs> well, I think not. Valin was beside himself. He trembled with rage. His eyes were bloodshot. The money, the twenty thousand, he stammered. Impossible. I need it myself. The money! Come, be reasonable, and don't get excited. It won't do you any good. Desprit seized his arm so forcibly that Verlin uttered a cry of pain. Desprit continued. Now, you can go. The air will do you good. Perhaps you want me to show you the way. Ah, yes. We will go together to the vacant lot near here, and I will show you a little mound of earth and stones, and under it... That is false! That is false! Oh, no, it is true. That little iron plate with the seven spots on it came from there. Louis Lacombe always carried it, and you buried it with the body, and with some other things that will prove very interesting to a judge and jury. Valin covered his face with his hands and muttered, All right, I am beaten. Say no more. But I want to ask you one question. I should like to know... What is it? Was there a little casket in the large safe? Yes. Was it there on the night of the 22nd of June? Yes. What did it contain? Everything that the Valian brothers had put in it. A very pretty collection of diamonds and pearls picked up here and there by the said brothers. And did you take it? Of course I did. Do you blame me? I understand. It was the disappearance of that casket that caused my brother to kill himself. Probably. The disappearance of your correspondence was not a sufficient motive, but the disappearance of the casket... Is that all you wish to ask me? One more thing. Your name? You ask that with an idea of seeking revenge. Parbleu. The tables may be turned. Today you are on top. Tomorrow... It will be you. I hope so. Your name? Arsène Lupin. Arsène Lupin? The man staggered, as though stunned by a heavy blow. Those two words had deprived him of all hope. Desprit laughed and said, <laughs> Did you imagine that a Monsieur Durand or Dupont could manage an affair like this? No, it required the skill and cunning of Arsène Lupin. And now that you have my name, go and prepare your revenge. Arsène Lupin will wait for you. Then he pushed the bewildered Valin through the door. Desprit! Desprit! I cried, pushing aside the curtain. He ran to me. What? What's the matter? Madame Ardermont is ill. He hastened to her, caused her to inhale some salts, and while caring for her, questioned me. Well, what did it? The letters of Louis Lacombe that you gave to her husband. He struck his forehead and said, Did you think that I could do such a thing? But of course you would. Imbecile that I am. Madame Ardermont was now revived. Desprit took from his pocket a small package exactly similar to the one that Monsieur Andermont had carried away. Here are your letters, madame. These are the genuine letters. But the others? The others are the same, rewritten by me and carefully worded. Your husband will not find anything objectionable in them, and will never suspect the substitution since they were taken from the safe in his presence. But the handwriting? There is no handwriting that cannot be imitated. She thanked him in the same words she might have used to a man in her own social circle, so I concluded that she had not witnessed the final scene between Valin and Arsène Lupin. But the surprising revelation caused me considerable embarrassment. Lupin. My club companion was none other than Arsène Lupin. I could not realize it. But he said, quite at his ease, You can say farewell to Jean d'Esprit. Ah! 
Yes, Jean d'Esprit is going on a long journey. I shall send him to Morocco. There he may find a death worthy of him. I may say that that is his expectation. But Arsène Lupin will remain. Oh, decidedly. Arsène Lupin is simply at the threshold of his career, and he expects... I was impelled by curiosity to interrupt him, and leading him away from the hearing of Madame Aldermont, I asked, Did you discover the smaller safe yourself? The one that held the letters? Yes, after a great deal of trouble. I found it yesterday afternoon while you were asleep, and yet, God knows it was simple enough. But the simplest things are the ones that usually escape our notice. Then, showing me the seven of hearts, he added, of course, I had guessed that in order to open the larger safe, this card must be placed on the sword of the Mosaic King. How did you guess that? Quite easily. Through private information, I knew that fact when I came here on the evening of the 22nd of June. After you left me? Yes, after turning the subject of our conversation to stories of crime and robbery, which were sure to reduce you to such a nervous condition that you would not leave your bed, but would allow me to complete my search uninterrupted. The scheme worked perfectly. Well, I knew when I came here that there was a casket concealed in a safe with a secret lock, and that the Seven of Hearts was the key to that lock. I had merely to place the card upon the spot that was obviously intended for it. An hour's examination showed me where the spot was. One hour? Observe the fellow in mosaic. The old emperor? That old emperor is an exact representation of the King of Hearts on all playing cards. That's right. But how does the Seven of Hearts open the larger safe at one time, and the smaller safe at another time? And why did you open only the larger safe in the first instance? I mean, on the night of the 22nd of June. Why? Because I always place the Seven of Hearts in the same way. I never change the position. But yesterday, I observed that by reversing the card, by turning it upside down, the arrangement of the seven spots on the mosaic was changed. Parbleu! Of course, parbleu, but the person has to think of those things. There is something else. You did not know the history of those letters until Madame Mardermont spoke of them before me? No, because I found in the safe, besides the casket, nothing but the correspondence of the two brothers, which disclosed their treachery in regard to the plans. Then it was by chance that you were led first to investigate the history of the two brothers, and then to search for the plans and documents relating to the submarine. Simply by chance. For what purpose did you make the search? Mon Dieu! exclaimed Despree, laughing. How deeply interested you are. The subject fascinates me. Very well. Presently, after I have escorted Madame Ardermont to a carriage and dispatched a short story to the Echo de France, I will return and tell you all about it. He sat down and wrote one of those short, clear-cut articles which serve to amuse and mystify the public. Who does not recall the sensation that followed that article produced throughout the entire world? Arsène Lupin has solved the problem recently submitted by Salvatore. Having acquired possession of all the documents and original plans of the engineer Louis Lecombe, he has placed them in the hands of the Minister of Marine, and he has headed a subscription list for the purpose of presenting to the nation the first submarine constructed from those plans. His subscription is 20,000 francs. 20,000 francs? The checks of Monsieur Ardermont? I exclaimed when he had given me the paper to read. Exactly. It is quite right that Varin should redeem his treachery. And that is how I made the acquaintance of Arsène Lupin. That is how I learned that Jean d'Esprit, a member of my club, was none other than Arsène Lupin, gentleman thief. That is how I formed very agreeable ties of friendship with that famous man, and, thanks to the confidence with which he honoured me, how I became his very humble and faithful historiographer. Man, this was an in-depth mystery. Hope you guys enjoyed the extra special, extra long episode. Uh, it takes a lot to get these out um, every single week. So if you want to support the podcast, that would just mean the world to me. Uh, I love be being able to bring this stuff to you for absolutely free. Uh, but if you do want to support the podcast and the blood, sweat, and tears that go into the show, I would really appreciate it. Um, it just uh, means means the world to me to know that the listeners enjoy it enough to uh, to give a little support uh, in this direction. So if you want to support the podcast, you can just go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com. And there's 
several different ways you can do it. Uh, the first and best way that you can do it, and it's totally free for you, is just to tell other people about the podcast. Um, I've been doing this for quite a few years now, and would love to continue to grow with the podcast, grow the audience here. So if you can just reach out and uh, you know tell somebody that you know about the podcast, get get somebody else listening, that is the best way for this podcast to grow and uh, for me to continue to be able to bring this to you. Uh, the other way is Patreon. If you want to become a patron of the podcast, I would love that. It's super cool. Uh, I got some uh, some perks for you if you sign up there. Uh, thank you to our existing patrons. It just means the world to, to know that people are willing to do that. Um, and the merchandise store, you can go to anotherworldaudiobooks.com. You can actually buy some merchandise that's been hand-drawn by me, hand-drawn designs that I've done uh, that you can get on T-shirts and mugs and all sorts of cool stuff. So check that out if you haven't already. And then uh, you can also you know, uh, support the show by um, subscribing on YouTube, where actually all the podcasts are there as well now on YouTube. So you might actually be listening to this on YouTube if you are. You make sure to leave a subscription there and uh, leave a subscribe. Drop us. I don't know what the wording is, but subscribe to the, the, the podcast wherever you're listening that just helps a lot as well and you can also leave reviews there's tons of ways uh, a lot of them are free that you can support the podcast and help me continue to be able to bring this to you every single week and uh, yeah thank you guys for listening and uh, supporting the show we'll catch you next week